Yeah. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the TIFR Colloquium. I would like to introduce Professor Kingshut Biswas from uh, ISI Kolkata. Uh, he'll be telling us about Fourier transforms on harmonic manifolds. Over to you, Kingshut. Okay, thanks, uh, Nishant, for the invitation. Uh, so, let me make this full screen. Yeah, is this okay for everyone? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. So let me start by recalling uh, the Fourier transform in Rn on Euclidean space, which uh, most people should be familiar with. So I just want to think about it in a slightly different way. So first of all, uh, let lambda be a, any complex number and xi uh, a unit vector in Rn, so a point in the n minus 1 sphere, Sn minus 1. Then I can construct a function. Let me call that E sub lambda xi of x. It's an exponential e to the i lambda inner product x xi. Okay. So uh, the first uh, thing you can observe about this function is that if you differentiate, uh, everyone knows what the Laplacian in Rn is, right? then this is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian on Rn. Okay, this function is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. And uh, secondly, uh, this function is constant on the hyperplanes in Rn, which are perpendicular to the direction xi, right? So xi is a unit vector. So it defines a family of hyperplanes perpendicular to the direction xi. The hyperplanes are of the form inner product x i equal to constant, right? So clearly, this function is constant on those hyperplanes, okay? And you think of this function when lambda is real, then you think of it as a plane wave, okay? Which oscillates as you move in the direction of xi. As you move in the direction of xi, it oscillates. Okay? And uh, Fourier inversion in Rn what it does is it writes any nice function f on Rn as a superposition of such plane waves. So let's recall the Fourier inversion formula. So you know the Fourier transform f hat of a nice, suitably nice function f in Rn is well defined. So if f is, for example, in L1 intersect L2 of Rn, so just if it's in L1, that's good enough then you can define the Fourier transform f hat. So that's also a function on Rn. And then we have this uh, Fourier inversion formula. f of x is a constant times the integral over Rn, f hat of t e to the i x t dt, right? Now what I want to do is, uh, this is an integral over uh, the t variable in Rn. I want to change this integral to polar coordinates, okay? So polar coordinates means I'll be integrating over the unit sphere cross the interval zero infinity, right? So when I make the change of variables to polar coordinates, then it becomes my f hat of t, it becomes a function of two variables, lambda, which is a real number from zero to infinity, and xi, which is a, a point in the unit sphere Sn minus one, and my e to the i x t becomes e to the i lambda x xi. Okay, the change of variables is uh, t equal to lambda times xi, right? So lambda is the modulus and xi is the direction vector of t. Uh, so then I get this formula, f is, a, is an integral, f tilde lambda xi, e to the i lambda x xi into, uh, lambda power n minus one. So that's the Jacobian of the change of variables from Euclidean to polar coordinates into d lambda into d mu of xi, where d mu of xi is the usual uh, Lebesgue measure on the unit sphere, Sn minus one, okay? So these functions that you see here are exactly these plane waves, e to the i lambda x xi. So this, we're writing f as a, 
if you like a, a superposition of such plane waves, all right? Now we can do the same thing in what's called n-dimensional real hyperbolic space. So some of you may not be familiar with this, but uh, if you remember uh, your complex analysis, then the unit disk uh, is a model of the two-dimensional hyperbolic space. Uh, you know, the Mobius transformations of the unit disk are isometries for the hyperbolic metric. It's a certain metric on the unit disk called the Poincare metric. So this generalizes to n dimensions. You have a ball model of this uh, hyperbolic space, which is the unit ball BN in RN. And the metric is a Riemannian metric on this ball, uh, four times the Euclidean metric ds squared divided by the function one minus norm x squared whole squared, okay? So with this metric, the, the ball becomes a Riemannian manifold, uh, which is complete. Uh, so that means uh, informally, as you tend to the boundary of the ball, the distance goes to infinity, the distance from the origin. So you cannot reach the, the boundary of the ball is at infinite distance from any point in the inside. And uh, the important point is that this uh, metric has constant sectional curvature equal to minus one. Okay, uh, so it's a theorem that if uh, if uh, X is a complete simply connected Riemannian manifold of constant sectional curvature minus one, then it is isometric to this uh, n-dimensional hyperbolic space. It's isometric to this ball model, okay? So this is the unique such manifold, complete six simply connected of sectional curvature constant equal to minus one. Now here in this ball model, what are the geodesics? So geodesics are curves of shortest length joining points. They turn out to be arcs of circles and lines in the ball, which are perpendicular to the boundary sphere SN minus one, okay? And uh, so now let's compare with Rn. In Rn, what are hyperplanes? Uh, they are hypersurfaces, which are normal. That means perpendicular to a family of parallel lines. Okay. So in Rn, you have parallel lines. In Hn, the, the analogous concept to parallel lines are geodesics, which meet at a, at a common point on the boundary. Okay, and uh, then you can look at the hypersurfaces which are normal to such a family of geodesics meeting at a point in the boundary. Uh, so let me draw you a picture. Uh, I have to get out of the full screen for it, yeah. Right, so here's the ball model. So I'm just drawing it in two dimensions. So here's a point Xi in the boundary. And I look at the geodesics, which, uh, so those are arcs which are perpendicular to the boundary. So I look at all the geodesics, which end at the same point on the boundary. So that gives me a picture, which looks something like this. And then I look at the hypersurfaces, which are perpendicular to this family of geodesics. So those will look like, so in two dimensions, those will be circles, Euclidean circles, which are tangent to the, to the boundary circle at the point Xi. So those will look like this. So it will be a one parameter family of circles like this. So the same thing generalizes in higher dimensions you'll get uh, the, instead of circles, you'll get spheres which are tangent to the boundary at Xi. So these, uh, these spheres are called horospheres. Okay, so these are the analogs of the hyperplanes that we had in, 
RN. Okay. Now, just like in RN, if I take the hyperplanes in RN, then the function inner product xi, what is that? That if this is the origin, then inner product xi, if this is x, inner product xi is just the component in the direction of xi, right? This much is inner product xi. This is the signed distance between the, hy between the hyperplanes passing through x and passing through the origin, right? This distance is inner product xi. Okay. And this was the function we used to create eigenfunctions of the Laplacian in Rn. So what we can do in Hn is the same thing. I take these horospheres and if I take, if I fix an origin, let's say the origin of the ball, then I get a function. So let me go to the notes. Uh, so we define inner product xi to be the signed distance between the horospheres passing through the origin and passing through x and uh, passing through xi. Okay, so in this picture, uh, if x is somewhere here, then this distance here, this is this distance is inner product xi. So it's a signed distance. So if x is outside this horosphere, then this is positive. If it's inside, if you're over here, then inside this is negative. Okay. So this defines a function which is constant on these horospheres based at xi. And now, uh, this function is called the Boseman function based at xi. Okay, this sign distance between horospheres. And the level sets of the Boseman function are exactly the horospheres which are based at xi. And uh, note that uh, this Boseman function, it tends to infinity as x tends to any other boundary point eta. So you can see that in this picture. If I take any other boundary point, uh, like say here, eta, as x tends to eta, this uh, Boseman function tends to plus infinity uh, because this horospherical distance goes to plus infinity. And if x tends to xi along this geodesic, then uh, it goes to minus infinity. So if I'm over here, then this x xi goes to minus infinity. So except for xi, at all other points, the Boseman function tends to plus infinity. Uh, sorry, Kingship, just a clarification. When you say yes. distance, you mean the assigned distance induced distance. By, the, by the metric, right? Right, right, the, right. Yeah, the hyperbolic okay. distance. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, okay, it, it comes with a sign, a plus one if you're outside the horosphere, based uh, passing through the origin, and minus one if you're inside the horosphere. Okay, so yeah. It's thanks. a sign distance. Just like yeah. in Euclidean space, this is a signed distance, this inner product. So it's the same in hyperbolic space. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, uh, so these are some properties of the Boseman function. And uh, now we can talk about the following. We can use this Boseman function to construct eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So let rho be, this is a constant, uh, half the dimension of the boundary. So that's half times n minus one, the boundary is Sn minus one. And uh, then for any complex number lambda and any point xi in the boundary of the ball, just like in Euclidean space, I can construct an eigenfunction e lambda xi of x by almost the same formula. It's e to the i lambda minus rho inner product x xi, which is e to the i lambda minus rho b xi of x. b xi is this Boseman function x xi. Okay? And it turns out this is an eigenfunction of the hyperbolic Laplacian. Okay. 
So I won't have time to define this, but on any Riemannian manifold, there is a natural second order differential operator, which is called the Laplace Beltrami operator. So how you can compute it is on a Riemannian manifold at any point, you can find what are called uh, normal coordinates at that point. That means in those normal coordinates, uh, the metric tensor, it's a matrix valued function. That matrix at in those normal coordinates at that point is the identity and its first derivative in all directions is zero. Okay, so you can find such normal coordinates. In normal coordinates, the Laplacian of a function f at that point p is just given by the same formula as the Euclidean Laplacian. It's summation del squared f del xi squared at p, where xi's are normal coordinates at p. Okay, so this is an intrinsic operator, second order differential operator associated to any Riemannian manifold. Uh, so it turns out this uh, this e to the i lambda minus rho xi, it is an eigenfunction of the Laplace Beltrami operator of the hyperbolic space, and the eigenvalue is minus lambda squared plus rho squared. Okay, and just like in uh, Euclidean space. This is constant on horospheres based at xi. Okay, so it's the exact analog of the eigenfunctions, the plane waves that we had in Euclidean space. And we can define a Fourier transform, which is called the Helgeson Fourier transform. So uh, this will be a function of two variables, a lambda and a xi. Lambda is a complex number. And xi is a point in the boundary of the hyperbolic space, which is the s, the sphere Sn minus one. So, if f is a CC infinity function, smooth with compact support, f tilde of lambda xi is just the L two inner product of f with this uh, uh, this eigenfunction. So it's integral over h n f x into e to the minus i lambda minus rho b xi x uh, d volume x. Okay, D volume is the usual Riemannian volume measure of the hyperbolic space. Okay. So this is the Helgeson Fourier transform. And then you have a Fourier inversion formula for hyperbolic space. So that's in terms of a certain function called the C function, the Harish Chandra C function. There exists a meromorphic function C on the complex plane, uh, which has no poles on the interval zero infinity such that just like we did for Euclidean space, fx I can write as a superposition of plane waves using the Helgeson Fourier transform. So again, it's an integral over the unit sphere and an integral from zero to infinity, f tilde lambda xi e to the i lambda minus rho b xi of x into mod c lambda to the minus two d lambda d mu of xi, okay? Again, d mu is the usual Lebesgue measure on the unit sphere. Okay. So the natural question is, uh, so Hn is a negatively curved manifold of constant negative curvature. Uh, does this generalize to negatively curved Riemannian manifolds of variable negative curvature? Okay. And so what we uh, will describe is a partial answer that uh, yes, for what are called negatively curved harmonic manifolds. Okay. So the first step before we get to what harmonic manifolds are is understanding what the boundary and what horospheres are for negatively curved manifolds. Okay. So boundary and horospheres, these turn out to make sense in a much more general context of what are called cat minus one spaces. So these are certain metric spaces. So a metric space X is called a cat minus one space. If it is a length space, first of all, that means any two points can be joined by a geodesic in the space. So what is a geodesic in a metric space? It's an isometric embedding of a closed and bounded interval into X. Okay. so for any points PQ, there exists an isometric embedding of an interval in R into X, uh, which starts at P and ends at Q. 
And secondly, it's called cat minus one. If it satisfies the cat minus one inequality, so this uh, is a, a way of saying, uh, in a, a synthetic fashion of saying that the, the sectional curvature is bounded above by minus one. Uh, so the way you say it using just the metric is that geodesic triangles in, in X should be thinner than in H2. So let me explain what that means. Uh, so, So if I take a geodesic triangle, that means three geodesics uh, which uh, join three points. So say X, Y, Z. Then if I look at the sides of this geodesic, those are three numbers ABC, which satisfy the triangle inequalities, right? So therefore it turns out it's a fact there exists a unique what's called comparison triangle in H2 which has the same side lengths, okay? So this is a triangle delta in X. This is a geodesic triangle delta bar in H2. And then uh, the cat minus one inequality says the following. If I take any two points on the sides of this triangle, let's say, uh, what's my notation? Uh, S and T, right? So if I take two points, uh, S and T here, then in this triangle, since these sides have the same lens, I can choose exactly two points, S bar and T bar, such that the distance of S bar from X bar is equal to the distance of S from X and the distance of T bar from X bar is equal to the distance of T from X. Then what I want is that the distance between S and T in X is less than or equal to the distance between S bar and T bar in H2. So distance ST less than or equal to distance S bar, T bar. So this, in this sense, this triangle is thinner than this triangle, okay? So this inequality is called the cat minus one inequality. Okay. So that's a cat minus one space. So there are some basic facts one can prove about cat minus one spaces. First of all, we know there is a geodesic joining any two points, but in fact, this geodesic is unique. Okay, so there is a unique geodesic joining any two points. And uh, that unique geodesic, it depends continuously on the two points on the two endpoints. So that allows us to say that any cat minus one space is contractible because uh, you choose any base point in the cat minus one space, and then you join any other point to the base point by the unique geodesic. And then you just contract along that geodesic towards the origin, okay? So any, any cat minus one space is contractible. And what are the main examples? So like I said, it's a, no, it's a synthetic notion of sectional curvature bounded above by minus one. So the main example for us will be X, which is a complete simply connected Riemannian manifold of sectional curvature less than or equal to minus one, okay? But we can have examples which are not manifolds. So for example, trees, that means graphs without any loops, uh, so trees are examples of cat minus one spaces. And uh, you can also have things called hyperbolic buildings. Uh, those are uh, cell complexes where the cells are uh, hyperbolic polyhedra, okay? And they need to satisfy some condition at the vertices, but I won't get into that anyway. So these are some examples of cat minus one spaces. So we can define like HN has a boundary SN minus one, we can define in general a boundary for a cat minus one space. So boundary X is defined to be equivalence classes of geodesic rays in X 
where a geodesic ray is an isometric embedding of the interval zero infinity into x, where two geodesics gamma one, gamma two are said to be equivalent if the distance between gamma one t, gamma two t is a bounded function of t. Okay, so the distance between the geodesic stays bounded. Okay. So should we think of these as two parallel lines? Uh... Right. So in uh, uh, in in HN in HN these are exactly the geodesics which meet at us at the same point in SN minus one. Two geodesics, the distance between them is bounded if and only if they meet at the same point in the boundary in uh, SN minus one. Okay, so these are all equivalent geodesics. This family, uh, this is a, these are all, e this is one equivalence class basically. So on trees also, it's the same phenomena, right? Uh, you have to have two rays which will meet. Uh, yeah, the, they'll uh, go to the same end point of the tree. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, right. So uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So just one related thing you mentioned uh, metric uh, trees with the I suppose you mean the the metric on the trees is the graph distance right 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 at the, but and, the the edges uh, don't have to have the same length the edges could have varying lengths the edges don't have to have the same all the same length so, so is it a uh, is it a computation to check the cat minus one estimate uh, for the d metric on trees is that uh, no no it's, or, it's very uh, easy that's very easy that's because any triangle in a tree is a tripod so you just for a tripod it's very easy to see you okay. see any triangle in a tree is just a tripod. So okay. That's all. Yeah. Okay. It's very okay. easy. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's the boundary. Uh, so gamma of infinity will denote uh, that to be the equivalence class of gamma. So then uh, the fact is that for any point in the inside x in x, and for any boundary point psi, there is a unique geodesic ray which starts at x and which ends at infinity in psi. Okay, so, so that you can see in this picture. Uh, this is your equivalence class of geodesics. So for any point x, this is the unique geodesic ray which starts at x and which ends at psi. Okay. So any point in the inside can be joined to any point on the boundary by a unique geodesic. So here's x and here's xi. There's a unique geodesic ray which starts at x and ends at xi. And secondly, uh, if I take any pair of distinct points, xi, eta, in the boundary, then there is a unique bi-infinite geodesic, which uh, which goes to xi in one direction and eta in the other direction. So um, in this picture, if this is xi, uh, let me draw another so, xi, and this is eta, then there is a unique bi-infinite geodesic joining them. Okay. So this is false in, uh, this requires negative curvature. If you have, uh, for example, a flats in your space, like a copy of R2, you see in R2, this equivalence class means geodes means uh, lines parallel to one direction. So this would be one direction xi. If I take another direction eta, okay, then there is no geodesic, bi-infinite geodesic, which is, asymptotic to xi in one direction and eta in the other direction. You see, there is no geodesic which goes from xi to eta in uh, R2. So here you need, but but in H2, you do have, and in any cat minus one space, you do have such bi-infinite geodesics. Okay, so um, this requires negative curvature, some sort of negative curvature. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, this last property may fail if in non-positive curvature, if you allow zero curvature somewhere. So if X contains an isometric copy of Rn, then this property will fail. You may not be able to join boundary points. 
but in cat minus one spaces, this holds. Okay, now we can topologize the boundary. Uh, and in fact, X union its boundary with something called the cone topology. So we just have to define neighborhoods of a boundary point. So neighborhoods of a boundary point are uh, points outside a, an R ball, a large ball around X, such that the geodesic joining the base point X to Y stays within distance epsilon of the geodesic joining X to Xi up to time R. So let me just draw you a picture and it will be clear why this is called the cone topology. So here's a boundary point. Here's X. Then I take a large ball of radius R around X. And I look at points outside this ball such that uh, when I join Y to X, and then I join X to Xi, then this distance inside the R ball, this is less than epsilon. So up to time R, you stay within distance epsilon of the ray from X to Xi. So if I look at the set of all such points, uh, that neighborhood of the boundary point will look like this shaded area. This is a neighborhood in the cone topology. This is a neighborhood of Xi. So as you can see, it looks like a truncated cone. Okay, that hence the name the cone topology. And uh, what you can show is that uh, X union its boundary with this cone topology is compact if and only if X is proper. So proper means that uh, closed and bounded balls in X are compact, okay? So, which is true for manifolds, okay? Uh, if, if your space is locally compact, it's it will be proper. So, uh, so, uh, so in this case, uh, X union, its boundary becomes a compactification of X. So, let me give you an example. If X is a simply connected complete manifold of sectional curvature less than or equal to minus one, then we know it's cat minus one. Then we have a natural map from uh, the unit tangent sphere at any space, uh, at any point to the boundary. Uh, what is this map? It sends a unit vector V to uh, gamma infinity, where gamma is the unique geodesic ray whose initial velocity is equal to V. Okay, so I'll just draw you the picture. Uh, you take any unit tangent vector V at X. So V defines a unique geodesic ray whose initial velocity is, is V. And then you look at uh, the, the end point of this geodesic ray at the boundary. So Xi is gamma infinity. Okay, so this is the map from the unit tangent sphere to the boundary. This map turns out to be a homeomorphism. So therefore the unit, the boundary is identified with a sphere, the unit tangent sphere in this case, okay? So for a manifold of sectional curvature bounded above by minus one, this boundary is just, is homeomorphic to a sphere. And X union, its boundary is homeomorphic to the closed ball. So this is just like what happened for hyperbolic space, okay? The same thing happens for manifolds, simply connected complete with sectional curvature bounded above by minus one. And for those who are interested in trees, if X is a regular tree, then boundary X is a Cantor set. So let me just draw you the picture. Uh, so for a tree, so for example, uh, like this. So geodesics in the trees just correspond here to sequences of zeros and ones. And geodesic rays correspond to infinite sequences of zeros and ones. So boundary X is identified with the uh, product space zero one power N with the product topology. This is a Cantor set. Is this clear? 
Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that just to give you a feeling for what the boundary look can be. Okay. Okay. Now we want to define what's called visual matrix. So given three points, X, Y, Z in X, you can define what's called the comparison angle, theta X between Y, Z at X. So that just means uh, like we had in this picture, uh, you take uh, a geodesic, the geodesic triangle with vertices X, Y, Z, you look at the comparison triangle, and then you look at the angle in the comparison triangle in H2. So this theta, this is equal to the comparison angle theta x, y, z. Okay. So that's a comparison angle. And then uh, it's a fact that these angles, uh, they increase monotonically as y and z uh, move along geodesics starting from x. So, uh, so if I take, uh, two geodesic rays starting from X ending at two boundary points, Xi and eta, then if I have say Y one and Z one, I get one comparison angle. And if I take two points further ahead, y2 and z2, then I get a new comparison angle. The angle uh, between y2, z2 at x is greater than or equal to the angle between y1, z1 at x. Okay, so these angles increase monotonically and they're bounded above by pi. So therefore they converge to a limit. That limit is defined to be the angle between the boundary points, xi and eta at x. Okay. So this comparison angle theta x xi eta is defined as a limit. And then you can define a metric on the boundary, which is called the visual metric on the boundary based at a point x in x. This is defined to be, uh, so rho x of xi eta is sine of half theta, where theta is the angle between xi eta at x. Okay. So this turns out to be a metric. It satisfies the triangle inequality and it, it has diameter one. And uh, this is compatible with the cone topology. It metrizes the cone topology. And uh, the, the visual distance between two points is one. Uh, that means sine half theta is one. In other words, theta is pi, if and only if x belongs to uh, the bi-infinite geodesic xi eta. Okay. And uh, for example, if you do this in Hn, then what you get if I take X to be the origin, then the visual metric based at the origin is just half the Euclidean distance between Xi and Eta in Rn. So it's half the caudal metric. Okay, that's easy to see. If I do this in Hn, then uh, the comparison angle is equal to the Riemannian angle, which is equal to the Euclidean angle. And if this is half theta, then this is sine half theta. Which is, as you can see from the picture, is half the Euclidean distance between xi and eta. Okay, so this visual metric you can think of as a generalization to cat minus one spaces of the uh, caudal metric on the sphere. Okay, now I want to talk about horospheres in a cat minus one space. So, uh, so we define a function of three variables, uh, x, y, and a boundary point xi. Uh, so it's the limit as z tends to xi of the distance bit from x to z minus the distance from y to z. Okay. And uh, this limit exists as z converges to xi. Okay. And uh, it satisfies a, a co-cycle identity. And uh, by the triangle inequality, its modulus is less than or equal to the distance between x and y. 
and uh, equality if and only if y belongs to if and only if x y and xi lie on a geodesic and if i fix an origin then i can define the boseman function based at xi it's uh, b of x comma origin comma xi so uh, the level sets of the boseman function are called horospheres based at xi so i mean the picture is basically what you are doing is here's your cat minus 1 space you're taking points z which are converging to some boundary point xi and you're looking at the spheres with center z which pass through some fixed point o in the inside and so uh, the radius of these spheres go to infinity and uh, if this is a point x then uh, what i'm looking is at distance x to z minus distance origin to z so that's just the distance between these two spheres okay so this converges to the boseman function as z tends to xi and in the limit you get a picture like this you get these uh, sub well for a manifold these will be uh, smooth sub manifolds just like in hn and uh, your boseman function is again it's the if this is the origin and this is x then this distance between the horospheres is the boseman function this is b xi x okay so just like what we did in uh, hyperbolic space doing the same thing in a cat minus 1 space okay so it turns out if x is complete and simply connected riemannian manifold with sectional curvature bounded above by minus 1 then any boseman function is c2 okay so at least we can take the laplacian of the boseman function and so then the question is when is if i want to construct an eigen function like i did in rn and hn i should take e to the mu times b xi right where mu is a complex number so when is this an eigen function of the laplacian for every mu in c and the answer is this holds if x is a harmonic manifold okay so this is a special kind of riemannian manifold so let me uh, define it so there are various definitions so one definition is so if x is a complete riemannian manifold x is harmonic if for any point x in x there is a non constant harmonic function in a punctured neighborhood of x which is radial around x so radial means it is constant on geodesic spheres around x okay so let me give you an example in rn an example of such a non constant radial harmonic function is what's called the greens function so in for in two dimensions so greens function on rn for n equal to 2 it's just log of norm x this is a this is a, a radial function this is constant on spheres around the origin and it is harmonic but it's a harmonic on a punctured neighborhood of the point okay and for n equal to 3 the greens function is a constant multiple of 1 over norm x okay in general it in higher dimensions it will be 1 over norm x to the power n minus 2 okay so these are uh, harmonic functions in a punctured neighborhood of the origin right uh, which are radial they are constant on spheres around the origin okay so with this definition rn is a harmonic manifold so there are several equivalent formulations so one which is a bit technical but which uh, gives the most information is that if i take any point x and i take a vector a unit tangent vector v at x and i take a an a radius r then if i look at the jacobian arv of the map 
from the unit tangent sphere to x, which sends v to uh, the uh, Riemannian exponential x sub x of r v. So if I look at the exponential map uh, composed with a scaling by factor r, so this is a map from the tangent space to x. So I can look at the Jacobian, that means the determinant of the derivative of this map at v. It turns out this only depends on the radius r and it does not depend on x and v. So this is, uh, so if I vary v over the unit sphere, the unit tangent sphere, this Jacobian is constant. Okay, so this is a map whose Jacobian is constant. Uh, and also it doesn't depend on x. So if I change the point x, the Jacobian will only depend on this radius r. Okay. So uh, on any harmonic manifold, there is therefore a function a uh, from zero infinity to zero infinity, which is this Jacobian. It's called the density function of the harmonic manifold. So a of r is equal to a of r comma v for all v in t one x. Okay. So from the definition of this density function as a Jacobian, it follows that this a of r is nothing but a constant times the volume of the unit of the sphere of radius r around x, right? Because remember, what is the volume of the sphere? It's the integral of the Jacobian over the unit tangent sphere, but the Jacobian is constant. So therefore, uh, the volume is a constant times the Jacobian, okay? So this de density function is nothing but the volume of spheres of radius of, of radius r. Now for a harmonic manifold, it turns out that if you look at the distance function from a point, so d sub x, this is the distance function from the point x. So this is a, a function which is smooth on the manifold except at the point x. Then you can take its Laplacian. The Laplacian turns out to only depend on the distance from the point x. And it turns out to be a prime over a composed with the distance function from x. Okay. All right. So another uh, characterization of harmonic functions uh, of harmonic manifolds is that they satisfy the mean value property. So uh, that means that if f is any harmonic function, then f of x is equal to the average over the sphere of radius r around x of f of y dy. Okay. So the measure on the sphere is just the volume measure on the sphere induced by the Riemannian metric on x. Okay, so this is the mean value property. So uh, manifolds where harmonic functions satisfy the mean value property are harmonic manifolds. Okay, this is an equivalent characterization of harmonic manifolds. So then there was a famous conjecture of Lichnerowitz about harmonic manifolds that uh, flat manifolds and locally symmetric manifolds of rank one, uh, these are easily seen to be harmonic. Uh, higher rank symmetric spaces are not harmonic. The Lichnerowitz conjecture is the converse, that any harmonic manifold is either flat uh, or locally symmetric of rank one. And... Uh, um, think so. you have yes. another five minutes. Oh, I thought about 10 minutes, right? Since it's 4.50, we started about a bit about after Sure, four, so. you, can, you can take 10 minutes. Uh, we usually okay. end at 4.50, but yeah, you can take another 10. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll be done by then. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, uh, so harmonic manifolds are Einstein manifolds. Uh, and so in uh, dimensions two and three, Einstein manifolds have constant sectional curvature. And so then they must be either flat or locally symmetric of rank one. So the conjecture is true in dimensions two and three. It was proved in four dimensions by Walker. And it was proved for all compact and simply connected harmonic, ma harmonic manifolds by Zabo in 1990. So this would include the sphere and uh, the, um, yeah, this would include the sphere, yeah. And the, the real projective spaces here. Yeah. No, sorry, the complex projective spaces, yeah. uh, CPNs. 
sorry. Yeah, and it was proved in dimension five by Nikolaevsky. So up to dimension five, it's true. But then uh, already in the non-compact case, uh, Damek and Ricci constructed an infinite family of counterexamples, which are now called Damek Ricci spaces. So I won't say much about these, except these are simply connected non-compact harmonic manifolds, which are Lie groups, uh, which are a semi-direct product of a nilpotent group with an abelian group. The abelian group is just R, and the nilpotent group is a two-step nilpotent Lie group of what's called Heisenberg type. And A, which is R, acts on N by what are called anisotropic dilations. So I won't say more about this. But these are homogeneous manifolds. Okay, the group acts by isometries. Uh, the metric is invariant under left translations by the group. So these are homogeneous manifolds, but these are not symmetric spaces. If the dimension of the center of the nilpotent group is different from one, three, or seven. Okay, so these give counter examples to the Lichnerowitz conjecture. These are not uh, locally symmetric. If uh, if, if you choose n appropriately. But uh, Heber showed that uh, the only homogeneous simply connected harmonic manifolds are exactly the Euclidean spaces, rank one symmetric spaces, and these damek ricci spaces. So if you want homogeneous uh, harmonic manifolds where the isometry group acts transitively, then they must be one of these examples. Okay, so now we can get to the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Uh, so since I'm running out of time, I'll just skip ahead and say that uh, if you define uh, uh, rho to be half the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary equipped with the visual metric based at an origin, then uh, you can show that on a harmonic manifold, e to the i lambda minus rho b xi x, this is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. And the eigenvalue is like in Hn, it's minus lambda squared plus rho squared. Okay. And uh, just like in Hn, now we can define the Helgeson Fourier transform by the same formula. It's integral over the manifold x, f of x into e to the minus i lambda minus rho b xi of x, d volume x. And uh, so we want to measure on the boundary to write the Fourier inversion formula. So we have a natural homeomorphism from the tangent, the unit tangent space at the origin to the boundary. And so the Lebesgue measure on the unit tangent sphere, it pushes forward to a measure on the boundary, which we'll denote by mu zero, okay? And now we can define the analog of Harish Chandra C function for a harmonic manifold, it's defined as follows. C of lambda is the integral over the boundary of this visual metric rho zero of xi eta to the power two times i lambda minus rho d mu naught of xi. Okay, so this depends on a choice of a point eta, but actually it doesn't. So uh, rather this is independent of the choice of eta and this doesn't converge everywhere for all lambda, it converges if the imaginary part of lambda is negative. And uh, then uh, as, as imaginary part of lambda tends to zero from the lower half plane, it extends to a continuous function on the closed lower half plane minus the origin. Okay, so except for the origin, the limit exists as you converge to the real axis from the lower half plane. So this defines a function on the real axis minus the origin. Okay, so this is the C function, the analog of the C function. And uh, now we can state the Fourier inversion formula. So the following Fourier inversion formula holds for some constant C positive. For any CC inf infinity function X, just like in HN, F of X is a constant times integral over the boundary of X, integral from zero to infinity, uh, the Fourier transform f tilde lambda xi e to the i lambda minus rho b xi x into mod c lambda to the minus two 
into uh, d lambda and d mu naught of xi. Okay. So the same Fourier inversion formula holds for these harmonic manifolds of negative curvature. And then uh, with uh, Niper and Peer Imhoff, we generalize this Fourier inversion formula to uh, the more general class of complete simply connected harmonic manifolds of what's called purely exponential volume growth. So this class includes all the known examples. That means uh, all the rank one symmetric spaces and the Damek Ricci spaces. So this gives a unified proof of Fourier inversion for all these uh, spaces, which doesn't use any group theory. Okay, so these spaces are homogeneous spaces of Lie groups, but uh, a harmonic manifold in general, we don't know whether it is or not. But this is a proof which only uses uh, Riemannian geometry. So there's no group structure. So yeah, so I should just say purely exponential volume growth means that uh, the volume of the R, R ball uh, is bounded above and below by constants times an exponential e to the hr. And uh, finally, to finish, a standard consequence of Fourier inversion is the following Plancherel theorem that the Fourier transform f going to f tilde, this extends to an isometry from L2 of x into L2 of zero infinity cross boundary with the measure d mu naught into mod c lambda to the minus two d lambda. Okay, so I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Um, let's thank uh, uh, King Shubhiswas for this wonderful talk. Um, we can unmute ourselves. And I open the floor for questions. So um, I have a question. This is Venki. Um, yeah. Uh, so what about uh, radon transform or things like that? So uh, ah yes. So so uh, there's a, a Francois Rouvier. He has a paper on the radon transform written after this paper. I mean, uh -huh. so he wrote to us and he he, uh, he sent us his paper that uh, he proves a Fourier inversion using the radon transform. So uh, like you have the slice projection formula. You have correct, the slice correct. projection formula in this setting also. And uh -huh. so he proves an inversion formula for the radon transform. And therefore, using slice projection, he proves Fourier inversion. I so see. he does that for harmonic manifolds, the same setup that we are working in. I yeah. see. So yes. I have uh, one more follow-up question. So the thing is, yes. so Helgofen actually has proved uh, several like support theorems and things like that for you know, involving right. radon transform and things like that. So something like that could be done in this general setting of this harmonic manifolds. Maybe uh, I have honestly I haven't looked at Rouvier's paper very closely, so I need to study that myself. So maybe yeah, support theorem and things like that would be nice for the radon transform. That uh, may be possible. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, uh, can you just mention the name once again? The the name of the uh, the author that you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, Rouvier. R O U V I E R E. Okay. Rouvier. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, his paper is on the archive. If you search, you'll find it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Or I can send it to you also if you want. Yeah. So. Yeah, that will be great. Yeah. Um, I can. I I have your email address. I'll just send an email to you. Then you can just reply that. Too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Sure. So I have one question. Uh, I see in uh, it's not yet uh, written in uh, bold, but uh, it says you are unable to prove Fourier transform oh. is uh, surjective yeah. isometry. Correct. So what yeah. is the what yes. is the difficulty there? Uh, uh, yeah, in, the difficulty. This is a good question. So this is something I'm still stuck on. It's something called, uh, you have to prove, uh, normally the way this is proved, uh, the surjectivity is by proving a simplicity of the Poisson transform. So a Poisson transform is uh, for every lambda, you have a, uh, a transform which takes functions on the boundary, two eigenfunctions inside with a fixed eigenvalue, minus lambda squared plus rho squared. 
so um, so uh, what you want to show is this Poisson transform is injective. Then you say that lambda is uh, simple. So lambda is the, the parameter. Uh, so for every parameter lambda, you have a Poisson transform P lambda. And so you'll say that lambda is simple if uh, P lambda is injective. And if you can show that uh, P lambda is injective for all real lambda, then you're done. Then you can show that uh, the Fourier transform is a subjective isometry. So the problem is simplicity. Yeah. Uh, proving I this uh, Poisson transform is injective. So that's not easy to prove for real lambda. I see. OK. Yeah, I mean, I don't uh, really understand it, but OK. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But I can tell you what the Poisson transform is. I mean, uh, it's basically you just imitate the formula for this uh, Fourier transform. Uh, huh? I mean, uh, what you do is you take these eigenfunctions, uh, e to the i lambda minus rho b xi x, and then you multiply them by a function on the boundary, some g of xi, and then you integrate d mu of xi. That gives you okay. a function of x. So that is the Poisson transform. It gives you an eigenfunction okay. because it's a superposition of eigenfunctions. So it's an eigenfunction. So that's the Poisson transform. So you want to show this map is injective for when lambda is real. I see. Okay. Thanks. Are there other questions from the audience? In this case, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Kim Shubhaswas for the wonderful talk once again. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Nishant, for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah.